Tonight, a suicide bomb strikes the heart of the capital, Kabul. This is supposed to be the most secure district in Afghanistan. It's believed the target was the home of the defense minister. My house first shook and then there was a loud, uh, you know, explosion that was felt uh, almost three kilometers away from where it took place. I am less than a kilometer away from where it is. It, it is a major security and intelligence failure. I think the impact of an attack like this on the psyche of the Afghan people in the capital is simply devastating. Kabul, to me, is the broken heart and soul of a country that is bleeding. In these pictures shared by the Taliban, we see Lashkagar, capital of Helmand province and once headquarters to the British army. In the past 24 hours, the UN has recorded the deaths of 40 civilians, with 118 injured here, as the Taliban encroach. If Lashkagar falls, it would be the first provincial capital won by the militant group since 2016. The Afghan army has today announced they're preparing a major operation to retake Lashkagar. They vowed not to leave a single Taliban alive, and they've urged civilians to evacuate. But for a city of 200,000 people, where can the displaced go? Families are trapped, and it feels like the violence is just beginning. There is no safe route for now. Uh, all routes are basically fraught with, uh, with, with danger. Yesterday, I was, uh, I was, I was visiting a, a health facility um, in, in Kandahar, and, and the health staff reported to me that they are, uh, they are seeing uh, people that are uh, fled from uh, from the north of Kandahar and from Lashkaga and making uh, their way to, uh, to to Kandahar. But those are the lucky ones. Some of them are still trapped in an area where the conflict is uh, is uh, is active, and those are the ones that we are uh, most worried about. Here, some of the faces of those displaced from Kandahar. Taliban mortars rained down on their city throughout the weekend, striking the airport on Saturday and killing five on Sunday. Kandahar was the birthplace of the Taliban movement. Its capture would not only be a strategic win, but also a symbolic one. No such victory for civilians. From January to June, uh, and, and our numbers are probably uh, far from the reality, but our numbers indicate three, close to 360,000 people uh, pushed away from uh, from their area because of the, the conflict. Now, we haven't been able to verify all those numbers and we suspect that the number of displaced person is much higher than that. And in Afghanistan, when you have a number of uh, displaced uh, family, then you just take 50% of that number and that gives you the number of children. Just next to Kabul is Loga province. We spoke to the head of its council. He sees threat building around him. We have conflict in four of our districts. We've lost two of them to the Taliban. We also have people arriving from Herat, Kandahar and Helmand. There's about 500 families. People from our province, they see people arriving and it makes them worried. Afghan people are poor people, our people are farmers. Before they had help from the Afghan government, but that stopped now. It's not just Afghanistan's responsibility, it's the responsibility of the international community because we are on the front line of fighting terrorism. We are fighting a war for the safety of the world. After tonight's explosion, citizens of Kabul took to the streets, defiantly chanting against the Taliban. This isn't just a war between army and militants. It's the struggle of civilians for safety and democracy. MN Nada. Earlier I spoke to Baba Baloch from the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and I began by asking him about the humanitarian consequences of this fighting. What we are seeing right now is utter devastation which is unfolding in front of our eyes. Afghans seem to be going uh, through another tragic episode of history. The figures are staggering. So 360,000 Afghan civilians have been displaced inside their country. 
and 60% of them are children, children under the age of 18. And the total number of displaced inside the country now is 3.5 million people. Mostly Afghans are running for their lives inside Afghanistan, but what they are looking for is peace. This conflict has to end to give the Afghan civilians a respite from the fighting. One of the things that happened, I think, earlier on this summer is many people fled into towns and cities like Lashkarga and uh, Herat, which are now themselves the scene of new fighting. I mean, there seems to be no internal refuge possible. When the fighting was happening in the rural areas, so, so they would run to places like Lash Lashkarga like to Kandahar, like to Helmand, Mazar Sharif. Uh, as the push comes and the conflict moves inside there, uh, where could they go now? This is a question that Afghans are asking. And they're also asking the question, why do they deserve this fate? Now, as we know, historically, uh, one of the main answers to your question, where can they go now, was Pakistan. Uh, still uh, 1.6 million or something like that uh, Afghan refugees there. But when Pakistan says now we won't let any more in, is that credible? Do you think we should believe them? Uh, Pakistan and Iran currently host 90% of 2.6 million Afghan refugees. Uh, Afghans have been uh, Afghans have been hosted in those two countries. Afghans depend on those two neighboring countries for many reasons. The images we were seeing were people who were sick, who needed to reach the hospitals there. So it affects them uh, as, as well in, in terms of the, the regions dealing with, with Afghanistan. But I think what they, they need and what they're asking right now is somehow someone somewhere comes to kind of make an effort to stop this uh, fighting. Otherwise, we are moving towards uh, another tragedy here. Where are you looking for the funding? Is it the US? Is it the Gulf states? In China? Who, who, who would you like to step in with more immediate funding? I think countries that have resources, countries that have been contributing in terms of the humanitarian efforts, uh, the call is on everyone. Do you see this developing into another serious problem uh, for Europe and European border control, because we read about the migration route through Iran and Turkey. Uh, lots of younger Afghan, particularly younger men uh, and boys taking that route. And how big an issue do you think that's going to become? So far, what we have seen, a majority of Afghans are being displaced inside their country, inside Afghanistan. The numbers who are reaching to Europe are small. If you're talking about Afghans who are arriving from Turkey into Greece, this year, so far, 4,000 people have crossed that part of the Mediterranean. You Very know cool. what the number of Afghans is in that? 1,000 Afghans have arrived. So the majority of Afghans are still trying to make it work inside their own country. They need the support uh, that, and they are looking towards the world that everyone else stands with them. Baba Baloch, thank you very much. Thank you. Joining us now is Mariam Wadak from Her Afghanistan, an organization aimed at supporting Afghan women, welcome to Newsnight. Uh, you've helped uh, mentor women to, to break through as engineers, as doctors. What do you think is going to happen to them now? I've been listening in to what your uh, speakers have mentioned, and I wanted to bring a little bit of context. Um, a majority of the population of Afghanistan is below the age of 35, that's 70%. And Afghanistan is going through a brain drain, and that brain drain is mostly males. The women find it very challenging in the current cultural context because they have this fear of what's going to happen next. There is no stability, no assurance, and the fact of if they should work. They need to work in the sense that now some of the homes in Afghanistan have turned into a matriarch.
And these women have to bring in food, but they are concerned that if they go and work and associate with themselves with any international organization, will that be the, the death of them in the coming years? When you hear um, commanders, Taliban is a broad term. We know there are all sorts of different insurgent and warlord type groups. But when you hear commanders saying they will respect uh, women's education and allow it to continue in areas that they've taken over, do you think any credence can be placed in that? I think that we must take what they say seriously. And this is a change in narrative. When the Taliban were first in power in 2000, in the year 2001, what, I mean, in 1990s to 2000, they didn't allow any females to attend to school. So there's a huge change. And I think that we need to acknowledge that change. And I think that change is not only with the Afghan Taliban, but there's a change in the Afghan people. The Afghan youth are not the youth of the 90s and they will not accept certain um, structures that are going to be placed by the insurgent group. And I think that this is the beauty of it. And this is where negotiation needs to come in place. And one of the key things that I force my young girls to focus on is how to negotiation, how to negotiate the art of negotiation. What can they give up? One of the aspects that I criticize the West for mostly in Afghanistan is that they focus more on attire. Oh, young girls are wearing jeans. That is a very superficial liberation, and that does not really justify anything, and more so has pushed back, has been pushed back, and there has been backfire by the Afghan uh, elders due to this. I'm afraid we don't have a huge amount of time, so if I could ask you briefly what your advice now would be to friends or or people you're in contact with, women, uh, would it be simply to be less visible or do you think they should carry on their life completely as normal in areas that have fallen to the insurgency? I think that they need to assess their certain situation and see how they could best operate in the worst case scenario. And I say the worst case scenario because in, things in Afghanistan have never improved. It's only gone worse to worse to worse. And if they find that less visibility will be will be able to give them freedom of mobility, then that's the best way to go. Many of uh, my young girls have changed um, their ways from wearing burqas to be less visible and um, minimize their activism. And not that this is something that I'm promoting, but they're looking Marianne. at their security. Thank you for that. A sobering uh, message there.